What we are going to try to do very quickly, if possible, is give a quick recap on what happened, then talk about some important placemaking ideas that came up uh, through that process. And as we go along from area to area along the corridor looking at what if pictures and so on, while we look at those placemaking ideas, we'll pause and I'll turn it back to Bill. We'll do um, some quick poll questions with the keypads like you've done at previous events. And I think by now everyone should have one of the little credit card size keypads. Okay. And, um, and we'll, we'll try for instant feedback. But then after we do the questions this time, we're going to pause and do 60 second shout outs about your answers. Um, we're going to get you to just from your seat and without the microphones, just holler out reasons why you said what you did when you pressed those buttons. We want to see if we can drill a little deeper about why you chose what you did. And then uh, at the end, we'll talk about next steps, a couple of important uh, upcoming steps in this process that you're going to find useful and you're going to want to be engaged in. And then when we adjourn, there will be a large number of people here from the planning team or from the staff at the various agencies and institutions that are working on this or the private firms they're investing and so on. And we're all in here to answer questions uh, on any of the material you might have. So if at that point, it's useful to put something back up on the screen. We can always bring it back up. First, remember why we're here. We're here, but like someone said in our very first meeting, along this 19 or 20 mile corridor from the Capitol to Weberville, you're all in this together. It's necessary to see what it is you have in common and how the Michigan Avenue, Grand River Avenue corridor can tie you together, while at the same time trying to respect your very important differences from locality to locality along the string of pearls. So uh, that's why we're here, because since you're all in this together, we need to have a unified vision for what the future will be, what the possibilities are for the next generation. Remember, we're not trying to do a design to fight the last war or to meet the needs of the last generation or the one before that one. We're trying to look ahead to what the needs will be upcoming and envision a place that you can build um, and rebuild together that will meet their needs. First, on recap, many of you, I'm looking at a lot of familiar faces, participated in May when we did part one of this two-part adventure. The first part was devoted to the vision. We looked at the whole corridor. It was kind of a high-altitude operation. And this time, we came back together to zoom in on three specific areas and study them with a focus on, on design possibilities in uh, much greater detail. Uh, that first event in May was structured similarly in that we had hands-on processes and a, a studio on location, but, a, but the work was pretty high-altitude work. Um, we looked at the map of the corridor together. We isolated along it where the opportunity sites were as we moved along from urban to rural, as we moved uh, from the capital toward Weberville from, in this map, left to right or west to east. And as we went, we asked people where they thought the most benefit would come from zooming in on special areas for further study. Well, one of those is right here in East Lansing, but that will get its own study. So that one we knew was coming as part of the upcoming work under environmental analysis, uh, environmental impact analysis that uh, CATA will do uh, for the bus rapid transit corridor, that yellow line uh, that ties you together from the capital to Okemos. So there were three others selected. One, the area of the east side that generally starts just east of the stadium and includes uh, the old Bingham School District, the Eastern High School area, Sparrow Hospital, and its environs. Um, I think most we learned across, during the week that most people refer to that as the east side or uh, the Eastern District referring to uh, Eastern High School. And then there's the area of the Red Cedar Golf Course, uh, the uh, the trail, the river trail, and the Frandor Shopping Center, um, or uh, Frandor for short when we first made this map, but lately people have been saying they think Red Cedar uh, sounds like a better name for that area. And then out to the east, uh, the area where Old Okemos, Meridian Mall, and points in between are. We, we picked those three spots for closer study this week. 
Now last time, uh, as, as a result of all of the hands-on work, a short list of important principles was developed. We've been calling these the cornerstones. Um, and they're here. I'm not going to read them all. You've, you've studied them before. Um, but we did want to put them back up to remind you. These served as the kind of uh, watchwords or guiding principles for getting started on the close-up work in these three very different areas. Uh, things like make it all walkable and bikeable by design. Well, that's going to come back up in a few minutes when we talk about the design grammar of walkable places. So now we fast forward to this week's event, the, the uh, round two, the October um, charrette. We had an opening event for Sparrow and Frandor on Tuesday night last week and then for Meridian on Thursday. Then we opened the design studio um, just up the street in the old Jacobson's building in the Innovation Center. And that's been a kind of round-the-clock exercise. We had two open house events, um, one for Sparrow and Frandor on the west, one for Meridian on the east. And then tonight, we've made it all the way to step six, the work in progress presentation. So let's try these little clicker devices out. So in, now think hard. <laughs> let's make sure these clickers are working. And let's see who's here. What is your age? Poll is open. You have seven seconds. The final number you pick, one through seven, will be the number it remembers. <laughs> Survey says mixed. We didn't ask anybody uh, if they were under zero years of age, so that's, that's good. All right. Now, the next question, sorry, this is a little covered up by the menu at the top. Do you live, work, go to school, or invest, as in property owners or developers? Uh, in the neighborhoods along the corridor. You can choose any one of those, one for live, two for work, three for school, four for invest, but if you do more than one of them, pick five. Or if none of the above, pick six. The suspense is killing me. I bet the answer is going to look a lot like it looked a moment ago. In fact, the scores did change. That's, uh, that's good. Okay. So it looks like a lot of people have more than one way of belonging to the corridor. Okay. Now we want to get a general idea where you are. But remember, you are all in this together. So we're not asking if you're a resident of this township or that city. What we're really asking is, to which of these landmarks are you most closely associated? One for Stadium, two for Sparrow Hospital, three for Frandor, four for Michigan State, or five for the Meridian Mall. Everybody ready? You can only choose one. So you pick one that you're closest to. Sorry, Julie. Pick one. <laughs> it's not that hard. The, down, the, the, the baseball stadium downtown. OK, you can open the poll. Poll is open. OK. So what this tells us is that we have people from all along the corridor. Uh, more from the east than the west, but people here representing their neighbors all up and down the corridor. Okay. The last question has to do with that, uh, the last time we gathered in this building down in the auditorium for a work in progress presentation. This will help me know how fast to go. Now, tell the truth. Were you there? Yes? One, one for yes, two for no. You can, that's an easy one. <laughs> Okay, so we have a few new folks, and we have a lot of veterans. <laughs> All the veterans are hereby deputized to help uh, fill in your neighbor if a question comes up. Ready to go back? Okay. So just to give you a picture, for those who weren't in the room when it happened, I want to give you a picture of what took place uh, at each of these steps along the way. Over at the Allen uh, Market Center, uh, which was amazing space, Joan, I have to tell you, by the way, for a community gathering, it felt very comfortable. People opened right up. Nobody felt stiff or, or uh, rigid like they, like they are when they're standing behind a podium or they're under the chandelier in a hotel ballroom. This was perfect space. And so there was a big noisy meeting with people working in small groups. And then after that, we had a report from each of the groups on the things 
that they um, discussed at their tables what was most important to them. Now we did do the uh, uh, annoying little exercise where we give you one car a, a little card and ask you to use one word, which almost everybody immediately violates that rule, and um, fill in what you see there, what word comes to mind when you think of that place today. And, um, and we did that first for the Sparrow area. You can see some of the answers. Fragmented jumps out. Um, the, 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 I think some of the respondents were, were giving us tough love, so they said blah and, and so forth. Uh, but that was, that, there were a lot of critical things, although if you look closely, you see people said things like opportunity and valuable resource to refer to this place as well. Hopeful was one of the responses. We asked them to do the same thing on the bottom of that card about that place in their mind's eye. What word comes to mind about the Sparrow area in the future? And words like vibrant, uh, multimodal, that's kind of a technical word, um, um, pedestrian-oriented, denser, uh, those are the words that jumped out. Bigger and bolder and this kind of word cloud means it's a response that came back mo more often. Uh, than the, the smaller words. So We did the same thing for, uh, for Greater Frandor. <laughs> it wasn't as obvious, but you know, a few, few words do jump out. Does that, go with, does that one self-explanatory? <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there to let it soak in for a second. This is how they saw it today, uh, but this is what it said comes to mind about that place in the future. It could be greener, it could be a gateway, it could actually be a kind of a calling card for the greater community. And also there's that word vibrant again, walkable and bikeable reappeared. Um, now you know we did this again in Okemos and um, I found a couple things interesting about this. One, uh, someone wrote 1970s, which was an interesting response. Uh, cars is the biggest word there. Too much undefined space was another. Uh, and then the one word that comes to mind in the future was not as clear. It was, there were a lot of answers, but people were at the center of the conversation here uh, and car, as opposed to cars in the uh, present day. Very interesting thing. Now, we always get good responses. I wanted to share one of them with you. One person wrote, don't make more silly word diagrams. <laughs> So whoever you were, thank you for that good advice. We are done with that. That, that stage of the process is now complete. Um, so as you detected, it was about time. Now when we, we got longer answers to uh, written questionnaires, uh, and we put those all into lists. So uh, we, we printed those out on poster size things. Um, I, I, ideas that have been mentioned so far or had come up in May. Uh, and what should be explored this week and what would be most useful to achieve your vision. So we printed those all out and then we gave people sticker dots and asked them to put their little green dot next to the one that resonated most closely with them. And you can see a few things were uh, more important than others. Uh, for example, strong connection to the Red Cedar River Trail was a very, very big one in this group. Uh, smaller blocks that are more walkable um, was another one. That, that got a lot of attention on these. So each time you made a response like this, I tell you, the design team was trying to take it into account, trying to absorb it, asking ourselves, well, what is it about the physical place uh, that brings about those answers? We had a series of technical meetings around a big conference table and in the conference room well, with the screeners, James Doherty and Paul Hamilton at one of those, um, going over work in progress as we went. So several of you attended one or more of those meetings um, and hopefully you got to see the work kind of evolve over time. At the open house events we stopped, put our pencils down, put everything up on the wall and then uh, let the conversation unfold around those. Same thing again, we asked questions, left markers, gave stickers uh, to, uh, to get responses. So here uh, Hannah Remsma, Lynn Martinez and Mark Wyckoff for having the debate of the century about whatever it is he's pointing to here. One of the things um, we put up was a poster uh, reflecting our own confusion. As soon as we said Sparrow, somebody said, no, not Sparrow, Bingham. And someone else said, no, not Bingham, Eastern. And someone else said, Spandor. And that was a great answer. 
<laughs> and so we did put up these posters asking for people to uh, tell us what they thought the names of these places really were. And those were revealing. And the fact that there's any confusion about it at all, honestly, it uh, suggests an area where work is needed. Uh, you know, to get the consensus around it, if you feel this decision's already been reached, it needs to be spread, the word needs to be spread about it. Um, after we had those meetings, we, we worked late into the night, most nights, trying to translate all the words and the numbers and things into visuals. I'm going to show you some of that uh, over the next few minutes. Bill asked me to do this, and I, I, at first I said, well, I've already got pictures of them. They don't need this too, but I think he was right. Bill said, let's just put a list up of all the different kinds of stakeholders that we met with in specific meetings in addition to just having people select themselves to attend an open house um, or uh, a hands-on session. With all the, the folks on this list, we had specific interviews or technical meetings around their subject matter. Uh, so it was very interesting to go back and forth between the many viewpoints. And although it's going up now because of all the volunteering you're doing by sitting here listening to me, uh, at the last count we were above 2,700 cumulative person hours in the last week that have been devoted by volunteers uh, or, uh, uh, and, and or hired guns like ourselves working on the plan uh, in progress. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, so here are some, some questions for you. Let's see if we can go fast through these. Okay, so let's just see who in the room with us right now was at one of those meetings. You, if you attended one of those events, you choose one, two, three, or four or more. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Come on, that way everybody will have at least one. Okay, so about three quarters of you managed to come in and touch the plan during the week prior to coming in here and looking up on the screen. That's pretty cool. Now, I want to uh, now take us on a little trip from west to east. So we start appropriately on the west with what's called the Eastern District. <laughs> I don't understand that, but that's okay. Um, on the uh, western end of our corridor is the east side. So. Here's the Eastern District. And as we go from place to place, I'm going to pick one or two things that seemed important on those lists and zero in on, uh, zero in on it. For, we'll do a little bit of what is it that makes that idea work or not work, or give you some technical information, and we'll also ask you a question about them. Um, one of the, the, this, now here you're looking at a map that has the stadium on the far left in the west. Um, general area of, of uh, Sparrow Hospital in Eastern high school in the middle of the map, and then it makes it almost to Frandor um, on the, f uh, or 127 on the far right, okay? So we made a big map, and Jennifer and her team sat there, and they went lot by lot, block by block, looking for opportunity sites where something was vacant and could be filled in, or, turned, or a green space could be created, or a street could be stitched back together, but basically looking at um, how you could gradually build upon what's already there while simultaneously restoring and rejuvenating uh, what's already there. And so the, the little red rectangles you see on this map are hypothetical infill buildings. The main thing to get from this map, this, I know it's very zoomed out, is that the plan we, we recommend in this situation isn't one where we scrape everything off and rebuild from scratch. This is, in fact, a surgical kind of operation where you need to build on what you've already got, and the priority is to add, not to destroy. Uh, however, there are a lot of places, especially along Michigan Avenue itself, as you can kind of get the sense of from this, uh, where new development really wants to be. And we're going to look together at some of the reasons why that would be, and I want to talk with you about the character that new development and infill development could take. Do you remember this picture? This is, some of you may have seen it before, this is a simulation uh, made from a photograph where first we visualize an upgrade to the street, uh, including bus rapid transit, more about that in a little bit, and then look ahead toward a time where with the revitalized address, new buildings will, will be filled in and among the ones that are already there. And in that, that last one, you see a couple of new buildings appear just across uh, from the mixed-use development that faces the stadium. Those, those are the buildings that flank the stadium. 
So that's a before and after what if. And when, uh, so here's the map you saw again a moment ago. On the far um, uh, left side of this, right in here, are those development infill possibilities. Wait a minute, those are the parking lots, right? Aren't those are parking lots right in front of the stadium. So this envisions a time when you're going to stop looking at surface parking lots as an efficient way to use your land and start looking at that land and saying, wouldn't we want to make place there um, instead of having it be a gap in the, in the form of the urban fabric? How about stitching it back together with development? That, of course, means you also have to be creative about solving things like where that parking is replaced and how the, uh, uh, the accessible parking spaces are, are um, substituted or provided in, in the body of those buildings and so on. So now you're looking close up at the map I showed you a minute ago. And here you see the bus rapid transit center uh, uh, system running down the center. Uh, a symbol on this map illustrating a restoration of the street tree canopy and new buildings filling in for the ones that were there before. And so as we move around the map, here's down to the south. Um, you can see uh, Hosmer and Eureka Streets. The examples of those infill development opportunity sites. Generally speaking, new buildings need to be filled back in of, the, of compatible building types to the ones that were lost uh, as, as uh, lots were cleared um, for excessive sur surface parking or just simply lost to fire or demolition and neglect. Um, Kalamazoo Zoo Street is an especially interesting opportunity. It's got the bike route. Um, it is a, a main street of sorts or neighborhood center in its own right. Uh, it has a, a really interesting eclectic mix of residential and, and non-residential development, commercial development. Uh, and so we've shown a bright spotlight on, on Kalamazoo, not just on Michigan. But back up on the avenue itself, we, we began to realize there were opportunities to fill in new private development. There are also special sites that might be reserved for new civic structures. Now, when we looked at Sparrow Hospital, we tried to pick up on what we had started back in May, envisioning the, uh, the possibilities for before and after there. But this time, we wanted to see how we might be more specific about what would achieve your objectives. Well, let's, so let's pick up on one of those ideas, the walkable scene, the walkable streets. The walkable neighborhood is, uh, is uh, really made up of walkable public spaces that are interconnected to one another, right? And what happens on the private lots is coordinated with what government does in the private rights of way, so that it's all one design problem. The relationship of building to street and those street trees or sidewalks and the moving traffic, it's all one design problem, not a private matter on the private lot to be left to whatever comes up and a public matter on the public streets. And so you might, often, it's instinctive to think, well, if we want it walkable, we just need more space on the sidewalk. We need wider sidewalks. In fact, that is true in some places. But most of the time, what you need is more other people around. You need a welcoming environment that will make others want to use it. Uh, that, that street, um, one of the great walkable streets, isn't, um, isn't uh, equipped with a very wide sidewalk, but it is equipped with a lot of reasons why people want to be there. So fundamental number one is you have to make street scenes where people want to be. And that has a lot to do with how it looks. Uh, it has a lot to do with how the ground floors of buildings respond to that sidewalk. They kind of open. Do the ones who are trying to sell you something actually let you see what's for sale, uh, as in the vendor here on one side? Uh, do you have clear views to signage and merchandise? Those things are important to retailers. But even more important, does light spill out of that ground floor onto the sidewalk after twilight? Or is it sealed up tight and dark? Is the glass clear, or is it tinted or reflective, so that as you go by, you can't really tell there's human beings on the other side of the glass? Uh, so these are the things we look for. Uh, one of the most important features of walkable streets is that they're shaped. Remember this idea? The proportion of building height to street width that forms the street into a public room. Um, that can be done with new development. This is a new development. That one's in Atlanta uh, that has mixed-use, multi-story buildings. And all those building-to-street relationship things are set up to create that sense of a public room. There are some other features, like raising the finished floor if the ground floor use is residential. Um, now think about that. If you have a slab on grade, 
even with a sidewalk or a single step up, that's probably the interior space there is probably not a space where you'd be willing to have your bedroom or even your living room. But if you lift the finished floor onto a raised foundation or a raised finished floor above a crawl space or a basement, or, uh, what the, uh, the architecture school books used to call the piano nobile, well then the space inside the building has privacy. Now a couple of powerful things happen. If you go by on, walking on foot uh, down the sidewalk when the residential unit has its elevated first finished floor, if they have their curtains open and you look through the window, you see their chandelier perhaps, but you don't see who's sitting on the couch and you don't see what they're watching on television. See the difference? But if it's slab on grade, like at the old Holiday Inn, and you walk by and you feel a little uncomfortable because not only uh, are the people inside the building having their privacy intruded upon, uh, you also feel a little bad walking by, right? And when you, have the, the, you don't have the elevated finished floor, you can be sure that the curtains will always be drawn or the shutters will always be closed. Do you have a question? Yeah, but how do you accommodate people with disabilities? Great question. Uh, when you have an elevated finished floor, how do you accommodate folks with disabilities? And it's an excellent question. There are a bunch of tools you can use for that. One, uh, and there's a very long list. Uh, you can make a ramp. That's one of the possibilities that can go perpendicular to or parallel to buildings. You can elevate one side of the building, but uh, uh, for example, if there's an alley access, you can raise the center of the block. That's very common in new development of, say, row houses like those, for example. Um, you can share ramped entries. You can have a lobby. This is very common. You have a lobby and you pull in with your wheelchair, for example, and then the transition to a higher level is made inside the building, a ramp in the lobby or a lift. And yet, yes, even in a snowy climate, you can have a lift outside the buildings. They have those in Iowa City, for example, um, where they get a lot of snow. Um, and a mechanical lift brings people up to the finished floor. So all, there are basically a bunch of technologies we can use to solve the accessibility issue with, with finished floors. What we don't want to give up is the value of that uh, dwelling. You know, um, and so that's an example of that idea. Now, um, as you know, I'm, um, I am a fan of Sparrow Hospital because uh, for a couple of reasons. One is they're phenomenal employers, they're growing, and they're part of the happy going forward futuristic story of this corridor, building new buildings, hiring new people, uh, doing great things, services to the community. And they're competing with those guys out in the suburbs who have all kinds of elbow room and uh, you know, plenty of land where they can spread out and that sort of thing. They're out near interchanges where people can travel to them and their cars really easily. Sparrow, uh, Plucky Sparrow Hospital competes with those uh, uh, folks and, uh, and wins. So I'm a fan of Sparrow Hospital for that reason. I'm also a fan of, of them because they're really good sports about letting us pick on them when it comes to the building to street relationship stuff that I'm talking about tonight. Is that okay, Tim? All right, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, so th again, thanks for keeping your sense of humor as we go through this. We, we look at scenes like this one, and we start thinking maybe there's a way to do all these things at once. Fill in lost space, repair the building to street relationships, get the privacy and the, the sense of eyes on the street, and build your way out of your problems so you can be efficient with the uh, scarce supply of urban land. So we began pasting things on to the map of the Sparrow Hospital campus. What if new buildings were built in front of parking garages instead of just behind them or on top of them or beside them so that when you looked at them from the street you were seeing storefronts. You got another view of that. So here's the existing conditions and then we imagine a kind of change over time when the avenue itself is upgraded uh, to permit the bus rapid transit. Did you see that? It's kind of, these are going to be kind of sudden. So here's the existing. Here's an after where the driveways are reorganized and the bus rapid transit is coming down the center. See here's Cata's speedy little future bus. And of course, anytime we are doing street rebuilding, it come, brings with it the opportunity to upgrade uh, the scene with all of the other components like street trees and lighting and signage and so on. So here we add another bus going quickly in the other direction. I like that the cars are relatively sharply in focus in this simulation, but the bus is a little bit blurred because in the future on this corridor, the bus is going to be the way to go fast. And then, but as new buildings are built, 
and they're built with building to street relationships. So you have doors and windows and storefronts and clear glass and light uh, coming out toward the street. So we're actually looking at a kind of optimistic way we might build our way out of problems in the corridor. Now that kind of thing can happen is as you start to get more and more of it, like two sides of street space, the synergy increases and you start to make a scene. Uh, instead of just buildings and parking, you have a place, an address, and turn that back to existing conditions. These are the before and after. Greener, bigger, but better. And so what we were just seeing in the computer simulations that Troy Homanchuk produced, uh, showing buildings designed by Mati Sechael, who's sitting right there, wave Mati. Um, we, um, we now are looking at in a plan view. So here you see, uh, say, Sparrow's uh, garage we were just looking at there a minute ago, or the medical office building that's here, uh, the bridge and the location for the future um, uh, bus rapid transit station. And then we begin to look at the remaining properties around and envision how they might be filled in over time uh, with, addi with additional buildings. Use is not known to us. It would stands to reason that inpatient and outpatient needs will grow and so will space needs at the hospital over time. And one thing about hospitals is they constantly need to grow, so they're constantly looking at how uh, to adapt and fill in space. I thought we'd show you a couple of variations on the themes. We zoomed in here just a bit. So there's, let's just follow this center block for a second. It has a little plaza space for dropping people off and uh, at the uh, medical office buildings. And here's another variation on that same idea. I don't want you to get fixated on exact footprints or square footages or building heights or things like that because we don't know. Obviously, that is for Sparrow to figure out at, at, over time and for the market to drive. What we do recognize is that you can do it this way or that way and still satisfy the building to street relationship requirement. And so the urban medical center uh, competes with those suburban ones by using its biggest strength, that it has an address in town, and it's stitched in together with the urban street scene. Like Columbia University is stitched into the heart of New York, not sitting out in a cornfield somewhere by itself. So let's see. Walkable, walkability. That was the question. Um, the big placemaking idea is walkable neighborhoods. So let's just check that. To see if we're on the if we got it right, do you agree? Walkability should be a major theme of future improvements and developments. Polls open. One for yes, two for no. The suspense is killing me again. And most say yes. Well, that, that's confirming. Not a big surprise. Although I was wondering whether we should just stop the presentation here and go home if that wasn't it, but. Yeah, thank you for confirming that. I'm, no, th but I want you to stop for a second and just contemplate how radical that is. Because in our parents' day uh, and our grandparents' day, when they were building the interstate highway system and they were uh, thinking wider roads or better roads and it was all about driving only, um, that would not have been the answer. So let's just look for a second at what the recipe is for, for such places. Do you want me to do this later? No, let's do it now. Do you I don't want to do it now. Yeah, I want to see why 95% of the people in here um, picked yes for walkability. And um, so let's just let's do a 60-second shout-out. Okay, so we're going, can you hear this? Are you picking this up? We're going to do, so tonight we're going to do a little bit of quick what we call shout-outs uh, to just get a little bit more information from you on some of this stuff. So the walkability component of it. So I've got my recorders up here and we're going to do 60 seconds, quick shout outs. Um, what about the walkability is most important to you? What are the pieces of it? Why? Why is it important? And what do we need to focus on with walkability? So, very quick. Exercise. Exercise. Hey, active living. Clean up the snow and ice. Clean, Clean up the, the snow, snow and ice so you can walk. And, uh, repair the cracks in the uh, sidewalks. Wait, okay. Repair the cracks in the sidewalks. No mud. What else? What's good for walking is good for bicycles. What? Reduce emissions. Okay. Right Over fast, there Holly. Improve the, uh, right fast, Lynn. Improve the density. 
What's that? Economic vibrancy. Economic vibrancy. Slow, down oh, slow down cars. One word. The okay, give me two words or three words. 20 more seconds. Patients don't walk, so they need their own walkability. Okay. Over here. Meet what? Meet people. Meeting people. Social. Community. Intergenerational. Intergenerational, yes. Increasing, numerous, uh, seniors. Increasing, number of seniors. Increasing the number of seniors. Safer for kids going to school. Safer Five for seconds. kids going to school. Okay, we've got, thank you. I didn't <laughs> That's get how everybody, a 60 second but, shout out works. Okay. All right, we're going to ask you to do that again on the next couple In polls. a few minutes, thank you. Now, I want to I hit you with a litmus test for this walkability thing, especially with regard to walkable streets. So bring me back over. Yeah. Um, yeah. And show me your next question. Uh, here's the, five, here's the, 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 the Victor Dover five-part test for whether you've got a walkable street. Certainly, there are nuances, and uh, there's artfulness that means creative blends of these ingredients every single time. And shaded may not be so important on the north-facing side where you actually want the sunlight. And, uh, and so you might, that might be some other kind of weather accommodation. But th let's just look at what these mean. First, the shape of the public space, legible like a room, walls and a floor. When we see it in cross-section, it looks like this, like the drawing on, on, the, uh, on the right. And every walkable place has walkable streets that do this deliberate space shaping. Sometimes the building's a little farther, a little shorter, sometimes a little tighter and a little taller, but that proportional relationship never gets so wide that the sense of enclosure disappears altogether. And that's, that's a pretty powerful thing. In fact, generally speaking, the tighter the ratio, the higher the sense of place and the higher the, parking, the, uh, the uh, property values. Um, so in Main Streets in particular, like if you imagine recreating part of, uh, of uh, Frandoria as, um, as, a, as a main street, well then it would have to achieve that kind of, of space making, um, space shaping. Main, that's the main street in Galena, Illinois, I'm sure you know it. And we, we actually drew a cross section uh, based on the dimensions of that place to see what that proportion is. So that's to scale, building height to street width. You see how if it was one story building set thousands of feet apart, the same effect would not be there. Um, However, we, uh, we often forget, because we take the classic American Main Street for granted, uh, just how much development there was on it. There's a you know, relatively small amount of acreage in the metropolis, but a huge amount of needs met, uh, and money made also, wealth created in those places that are well shaped. Now, sometimes the shape is given by the trees, but, also, but street trees are also very powerful components. Uh, shaded means more than that. It might, might mean protection from the sudden storm or from the glare um, or from the snow. But, uh, but we always look for the, how a place is climate adaptive or climate responsive. Uh, in the summertime, we know the trees are pretty important. And trees are very powerful when they're deliberately lined up. You know, the first rule of design, according to Robert Stern, is when in doubt, line things up. Um, sometimes when we're looking at them in plan and we draw a set of street trees in a row or even imagine this, in pairs, like that, uh, the urban forester will say, well, that's not the way they grow in the forest. Or that looks like soldiers lined up, how boring. It isn't boring. It's, bo it's not boring at all. Um, in fact, the difference between each tree and its own in, uh, intricacy and differentiation gives it plenty of visual interest. It's OK to line things up. Same thing goes for lampposts, by the way. Um, the third ingredient is this connectedness. The great streets are actually somewhere and they lead from somewhere to somewhere else like they get you to your destinations. They lie along natural paths uh, for human beings going from A to B, driving or walking or using transit or on their bike. So that one in Galena that we saw is this nice little curve here. But if you look carefully at the map, what you also see is that it's intersected by the rest of the street and block network that takes you up the hill and down the hill uh, and around to that main street. Everything I just told you is heretical uh, to the old school uh, transportation plan and traffic engineering of, say, 25 years ago. In fact, that is reproduced from the Wisconsin DOT uh, traffic manual. Uh, it says this is how you're supposed to do it. 
well, not connected, in fact, the more disconnected, all the way down to the, the tree-like branches that lead to your cul-de-sac at the end of the branch. Uh, everybody coming back to the trunk for every trip, that tends to be uh, something uh, that generates bigger and bigger, angrier, louder uh, roads on the big roads. And so, just like in their diagram, what happens is when you clip enough of the links in the network and you push this hierarchy thing too far, you get the interchanges, right? The grade separated crossings and so on. But, so that's where that, that's the ultimate uh, result of the other way of thinking. So yeah, I'm deliberately bashing the disconnected way of thinking and saying, you know, there was another method. We used to make networks, grids, webs, uh, in our street systems that deliberately brought people together. And then we did have to have a wide road. This one's four lanes wide. That's only half of it. We made them beautiful, like great parkways or great boulevards. Uh, and that's, of course, the possibility for roads like Saginaw and Grand River Avenue and Michigan Avenue. Um, what is it that makes a walkable street safe? Well, one of the things is uh, that you're not afraid that you're going to get killed by traffic, right? You can feel like you can interact with it and you're not going to get run over. You can cross it on the crosswalks. You can stand on the edge of the sidewalk. You don't fear someone is going so fast that they're going to lose control and use you as a traffic calming device. Um, but there's a more to safe than that. There's also the sense that this is a place that's watched over. So when you have storefront windows, this is pretty important. Uh, the, that light that I talked about streaming out of them, that's what gives you the sense that, the, that there are human beings around. So if you were to need help, someone might hear you call for help. If you were, to, if you were contemplating committing a crime, you might hesitate because you realize there are what Jane Jacobs called eyes on the street. So back to my favorite example of residential on a busy street, here there are eyes on the street. There are all these little symbols and signs of human occupancy that send a message to the would-be evildoer, don't do it here, because you will be seen, and this is somebody's territory. And then last, this is a little more vague, uh, the great walkable places are memorable and beautiful. We are a very demanding species, so we go back to the places that, that satisfy our senses and make us feel good about being there. Uh, we tend not to go back over and over to the places that leave us feeling uh, emotionally or visually starved. And it's interesting when you create that, just how willing people are to have a lot of stuff go on in the same space. In this space, there's deliveries and traffic moving back and forth, a cycle track for the bikes, uh, several pedestrian routes intertwined. There's a, there's a subway underneath the metro. There's transit up, up above on the street in a busway itself. There's multi-story mixed-use buildings all doing all sorts of things. It doesn't hurt anything that all that activity and all that coming and going is brought close together. In fact, what it did was it made the place valuable is and memorable. Is that in the US? It's not. Uh, we have a lot of streets that are built on that model, but I, that picture, which I grabbed about 45 minutes ago, happens to be Paris. That's the Boulevard Rochechois, um, if you, if you want to go check it out on Google Earth. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do it an, another uh, sense of the room. I talked about all these things. So, I, well, I talked about most of these things. Um, which of these features on this little list would most affect your desire to walk or bike in a place? Curious, like, which one jumps out at you as the one most likely to affect your behavior? One for street trees, two for wider sidewalks, three for calmer traffic, four for no blank walls, and five for more parking. Got to get out of your car, right? Um, polls open. Five seconds. Just pick one. Ah, interesting. Okay, so the, act, the behavior of the traffic and the street trees are at the top of the list. All right, let's do a 60 second shout out and hear why that is. Okay, so my question to you are, let's look at the top three. Calmer traffic, let's talk about that for a minute. Why, Safety. what? Safety. Safety. Okay. Why is calmer traffic help? Less distractions. More reaction, time. More reaction time. Somebody who picked that one, tell us why you picked it. Less noise. Less noise. Call more traffic because there's more going on there. There's more going on there. It's people friendly. It's people friendly. One more. Mm -hmm. Higher capacity. What? 
higher capacity. Now, okay, let's look at the next one. That street took 20 trees. seconds, by the way. Good job. Street trees. <laughs> why are street, tre why is street trees good for walking for uh, shade? shade. Aesthetically pleasing. Protection from the rain. Protection from the rain. Aesthetic. Aesthetics. Separation. Se separation from traffic, from vehicles. Very, very good. They don't move. They don't move. Okay. And then finally, the no blank walls. Why is that important to walkability? Engagement. Engagement. One more. T one. Something to look at. Something to look at. Variety. Aesthetics. Aesthetics. It goes faster. The block goes faster. The block goes faster. Safety. Safety. Time's up. Stimulation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So while we're in this neighborhood, and I just talked a little bit about it already, uh, let's let's zero in on one of the other placemaking ideas, which is uh, you can switch it. Um, the um, proposed bus rapid transit line, or BRT. I was a little surprised to learn. Um, I shouldn't have been, but I was surprised to learn when we came in August, uh, and even in some of the email correspondence since, uh, that there are a great many people, uh, including insiders, elected officials and, and others, who, di who didn't know that this corridor has been the subject of discussion for an, a big transit upgrade on the BRT, uh, via the BRT. Uh, there were people uh, who were in a position to know, but didn't know that uh, Okemos was being discussed as the start of the line. Well, we said end of the line, and someone corrected us the other night. The start of the line uh, on the eastern end. Big, that's a, uh, Okemos Meridian area, that's a big uh, feature for you uh, in that area. So just really quickly, bus rapid transit is not like riding the regular old bus. It's, it's, it's quite a bit different. These are, there's a picture here of the, at the top of the one in Eugene, Oregon, which is kind of a breakthrough college town application of this idea. It's like riding a streetcar in a lot of ways, except without rails. The, the vehicles tend uh, will pull up to a station where you've already bought your ticket or paid your fare, um, or you have a fare card, and you don't stand in line waiting for people to step up into the bus and pay the driver. Instead, the side doors of this thing open, and everybody gets on and off at one time really fast, and it goes. Uh, so that's a pretty powerful thing. It'll be, for a lot of you along the corridor, like having a horizontal elevator uh, that you can step on at the stadium and step off at, at the baseball stadium and step off uh, at MSU or at Sparrow Hospital or step on uh, on the eastern end at near the Meridian Mall and step off at your place of employment, campus or hospital or downtown. So very, very, very uh, compelling thing. Cleveland has a great new system. It's called the Health Line. It's a new bus rapid transit uh, system you can check out. And so I'd encourage you, if you don't know about BRT, go check it out. Pretty amazing, uh, revolutionary thing for transit in the United States. Uh, there have also been a couple of articles published in the last week or two that are interesting. Uh, economic impact of BRT exceeding that of new streetcar lines in many cases. Uh, and we wonder, why is that? Well, first of all, it can, you, for the money, you can go so much farther than if you have to build rails and erect catenaries to carry wires that you can implement a bigger corridor sooner and connect your places of employment with your places of residence. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty powerful reason for it. So we spent some time looking at BRT. Marty drew a, a sample of a kind of idea of a station canopy just to help you visualize what coming to the bus stop would be like. For those who are with us um, over at um, Chippewa Middle School, it will be the opposite of that photograph we showed you of the old way of doing things, where people are standing in line at the park and ride um, in the sun uh, without protection. This, these would be exciting places to be for the 10 minutes or less you'd have to wait uh, for the rapid uh, BRT vehicles to come. And so this is a version that illustrates what it might be like in the center of the street. Now, BRT is not a done deal for your region. It's simply it, any federally supported uh, new transit operation has to go through a series of steps. I don't remember, you're in step three, step four. Anyway, you've done several important steps and you've moved on to the all important environmental analysis that'll come up in the next several months. So that's going to answer.
questions that are na that, that nag all of us about exactly how does it work, how do you do it, how do you get through the skinny parts of the corridor, and so on. But for now, um, I think it's okay to say, squint your eyes and imagine just how cool it would be if it was already there. Um, well, we did a I'm just going to quickly show you a series of drawings that illustrate a lot of new development and the rebuilding of the street and fit the streetcar, how it would work in the narrowest sections uh, as it came together and, uh, and around stations, how, it, how we could accommodate left turns, things like this. We've been sitting with the traffic engineers trying to figure those things out. I think the results were very promising. Uh, when you have more right-of-way, as much of the corridor does, a couple hundred feet, uh, the prospects are quite good for getting all of your cake and eating it too um, with the mixture of street trees and parking and cycling and the BRT uh, and new development sites all along. So there's an in-between size. Sometimes it's 99 feet. Sometimes it's 200 feet. Sometimes it's 120 feet. Uh, and so different solutions will have to be applied in each of those kinds of places as, uh, as the corridor is remade. Now, this one has rails. That's St. Charles Avenue in New Orleans. But I put it up there just to give you a kind of reminder how cool it can be for the region's placemaking to be linked up with its transit making. Um, you can't imagine St. Charles without its streetcar line or the streetcar line without the beautiful linear park in, that, in essence, St. Charles is. So um, we, we look at those, at all of this as a kind of a Ensemble. It's an opportunity to remake these addresses that comes with improving the transit. Um, Vic from uh, Bob Ford's firm did sketches that illustrated other kinds of things that could come at the same, uh, in the same package, like wayfinding and placemaking monuments and signage uh, to give more identity to these places. You'll have to agree on what they're called <laughs> before that happens. But, but it, was a, it was a good idea, and as we look at other peer projects around the country, they usually time their upgrades and street improvements with some clever, uh, thoughtful signage to help people find their way and, um, and to mark their place. And so uh, Vic went uh, and took a lot of photographs and laid tracing paper on top and imagined all of the movements and did these sketches, which you can study in more detail later, illustrating the combination of things I've been describing. So I want to ask you a question about BRT. If it were already there, if the BRT were in place today as envisioned and as we've talked about in this corridor, would you personally use it? Would you sometimes ride it? Now, sometimes means sometimes. Don't answer only if you think you would commute on it every single day or take several trips a day. Would you sometimes use it? Yes, maybe, or no. Poll is open. Debbie Alexander from CADA is in the back of the room in suspense that you see your answer. She's waiting to build this thing. 82% said yes. 14% more said maybe. That's a pretty big number. At least this group is the market. So let's find out why. Okay, so we want to find out what it takes. You know, what is it about it? What does it have to be there? Why would you take it? What, what, what about it would make you want to take it? Speed? Yes, close to my office, my house directly. If it's close buy your house directly, it's convenient, less traffic, less traffic. what was that? Economical. Economical, less traffic, more relaxing, more relaxing. Aesthetically, no parking issues, no parking issues. Aesthetically, pleasing. aesthetically pleasing, good for the environment, good for the environment. affordable, affordable. Less, less gasoline, less gasoline. Safer. safer, what'd you say? Cost effective, Cost effective. You, can do other you can do other, other things. Well. Well. Other, you can do other things while you're there. Multifunctional. Okay. Multifunctional. Okay, thank you. I think the CATA video crew will be conducting man on the street interviews with each of you uh, to gather that body of evidence. That was beautiful. All right, nice to see. Thank you. What did she say? She said it's fun. It's fun. Okay, good. That's very good. I like it. Would these vehicles stop the traffic lights? These vehicles. Uh, would in interact with traffic, but they would have their own lanes, which, which uh, means they're not stuck in traffic. When they get to the intersections, there are a couple of ways you could do it. We don't know yet. One is that they could have preemptive control over signals, like emergency vehicles do. They are, it's also possible to do bus rapid transit without that feature, so that's, that would have to be determined. But signal preemption, as it's called, is a great advantage, uh, especially if they can jump the signal and go before everybody else. 
would be re uh, less rapid. It would be, yeah. You have to stop the same traffic lights at the other district. Of course. Now let's move a little bit further down the corridor to the Frandor and Red Cedar Golf Course uh, area. We're looking at Randy Park. Our, our, um, our uh, area for study today includes the Red Cedar Golf Course to be transformed into a dramatic stormwater park. It includes the area of uh, the Frandor Mall and the old car dealerships. We've, we've looked at this picture before, like how could that stuff be changed? And it includes the area north of that where the the uh, more successful parts of the shopping center and the devil's triangle of, <laughs> not the term we gave it, that somebody else told us it's called that, of Saginaw and Grand River are located. So we're going to look at this. So here's the big placemaking idea about this. It will change, but it will not change all at once. If you stand on the corridor, there are two important factors, or three important factors. One is there's an important public-private partnership project unfolding right there on Red Cedar, as the old golf course is replaced with a combination of development and, and uh, ecological park and, and open space, plus those vacant car dealerships and the other vacant commercial buildings along the corridor are pregnant situations for redevelopment, especially if it's transit-oriented redevelopment that takes advantage of the new uh, station that would be located there. And then third, the bus rapid transit would have a stop right there. So the the shorter term potentials are right there on the corridor on Michigan itself. However, to the north, the shopping center with the big parking lagoon in the middle is successful. It's virtually completely filled. Cash registers are ringing. Parking spaces are used. Owners are happy. Tenants are happy. It's not beautiful, I'll be honest. Even as an outsider, objectively saying, I can tell you, uh, nobody goes to Paris to see the parking lots. And that, so, it, so it's not beautiful. Um, someday, those property owners will look at that big expanse of surface parking and those one-story buildings and think, I wonder if we could do more with this property than we're doing. And when that happens, the market tipping point is reached, someday you'll see that plowed under and replaced in some kind of incremental way. And then as you get to the north, up on Saginaw and Grand River in the northern areas, some of the buildings are new, some of them are old. Traffic is a mess. Uh, somebody has to press the restart button on that intersection to get it to turn it into uh, a place where redevelopment interest will someday be focused. So we kind of see a change over time process going from south to north. So here's a step-by-step -step look at that. The, in the southern end now, you see the new park replaces the golf course um, as a combination of uh, handling. Uh, natural systems and drainage to handling the big amounts of water that are coming into the watershed there, it, uh, sending them on their way clean when they re-enter the river um, because they've, they've been treated in the park itself, new open space. And then those red buildings we've been talking about before, new transit-oriented development around a station area right there on, on Michigan. And then over time, more of that will get filled in and the scene will become more complete. It's also logical to think that even though in the last decade or so some improvements were made to Ranny Park, that that resource will be made better over time as well. In particular, its relationship to Michigan Avenue itself needs, a, needs uh, some design therapy. And, um, and, the, and the, the shopping center on its eastern side uh, looks like a, a, a kind of site that in the five to ten year period will find its way toward being redeveloped. And in the fullness of time, development will eventually come to take over those areas where Sears and north of Sears are located, uh, and a whole new kind of scene will be made there. We're speculating now, aren't we? But we're speculating that it would go from buildings poking out of parking lots as the urban pattern, or really the sub-urban pattern, to buildings along street scenes and a network of streets and blocks like the ones we've been talking about. We're speculating that eventually the values, not first, but eventually the values, will justify things like parking structures just not at first, when parking will need to be handled the less expensive way, which is surface lots. So it just walked you through decades of potential for the Frandor area. But it will start with something smaller, and hopefully something impressive. Something on, would, that would really be magical is if it happens on both sides of the Michigan Avenue corridor. So when we arrive at that spot, we feel a whole scene has been remade the new and better way around the station. 
um, instead of just half a scene, uh, as some have said the baseball stadium uh, has. So this is zooming in on that area that's most important. I want you to focus first on the corridor because those buildings right along Michigan Avenue on the widest public space or street width, remember the proportion, are the ones that really should be the taller ones. Uh, they also should frame open space or views into the park. It doesn't have to all be a wall of development. It can have important windows. Uh, here you see one is aligned with the southern end of Ranny Park and then a kind of uh, green uh, that's appended to and part of the big park. So the natural path of the stormwater is eventually to make it through Frandor and down to Red Cedar. And then north of that, uh, what's envisioned here is a main street that tees off of Michigan Avenue. So you have the biggest street in the regional street on Michigan, and then you have the neighborhood local street, uh, the new Frandor Avenue, eventually coming out where Frandor Avenue today comes out at the Speedway gas station and the uh, Burger King. And this is a sketch that um, Nestor Arguello and James Doherty did uh, with Matt Hull's help, help of what a, a grand central space inside that remade Frandor could be like. And the you know, stores would still be there. You could have stores, including the anchor stores, but now that land would also be used uh, with, for houses and offices or hotels, hotel rooms and that sort of thing. We were just looking at that kind of space. And then we get to the north, to the Devil's Triangle. Spend just a second here. Um, the traffic engineer said something very interesting to us. They, they went through a whole series of alternatives looking at this this week. And we, we originally hadn't planned to do anything about this. We thought it was really just beyond the northern boundary of our area of focus. Um, assumed it would be for another day. And then so many people came and said, you just got to do something about this. This is the place we hate to ride our bikes through. This is the place we feel uncomfortable driving. Uh, this is the place where several uh, tragic accidents have occurred and so on. Please do something about the Devil's Triangle. So we turned the traffic engineer and said, what can we do? A whole series of sketches were generated of all kinds of different options. In fact, the, at one point, Hannah Remtma uh, turned to me and she said, you know, if all we cared about was just trying to, given these, this awkward collision of corridors and one ways meeting two ways and so on, if all we cared about was moving the maximum number of cars, the design of the intersection we would come up with is basically the one that's there. So I answered saying, that's not all we care about. We've been hearing loud and clear. People have other considerations. So what else could we do? And that's when the idea of regenerating the intersection, um, making a public space instead of just a traffic, traffic space came out. Now, this is one you're going to want to stare at for a while. And not on this copy, but with the one that has all the little arrows on it that show all the little lanes and how you'd move from here. To, trust me, you're going to want to do that. But essentially what it does is it untangles the mess. It creates a big uh, linear park or square, and you, go over, you circulate around it. And they spent a lot of time with it, uh, analyzing how once that were reconstructed, how every movement would be accommodated, and even anticipating that a lot more people might want to come south on Frandor Avenue after uh, the improvements we've described. Um, and uh, and we, we looked at it through the lens of what it's like for people trying to get around uh, on non-motorized ways. Uh, she actually put it into the computer and loaded all those intersections uh, with all of their travel demands uh, to see whether it would work. Bottom line, it's, uh, it is very possible. Not that what I'm, we're illustrating here is easy or inexpensive, uh, but it wasn't easy or inexpensive to build the nightmarish thing that's out there now. Okay. So I leave you with that thought, and uh, at the end, uh, you're going to want to stare at this more closely with all the, uh, again, with all the arrows marked and so on. So we'll come back to that. We did, uh, yes? Is the responsibility for that just the Michigan Department of Transportation? <laughs> Great question. 43, I bet you know the answer. County and the city of Lansing and Who's the responsible for doing that? And I think the answer is the same answer that what you saw on the very first slide. You're all in this together. It's not something that you can really just uh, ask one of your agencies to solve by themselves, that particularly not given the boundaries of these, of these municipalities and the many stakeholders 
So I'm glad you asked the question. This is not just M dot's problem. Uh, this is this is the one where you're all in this together. Um, so um, that what you just saw there was saying instead of having a traffic only solution, why don't we solve the traffic problem with uh, making public space? There's more to public spaces than that. There's also how they look from the street and whether you make them welcoming and seem like people places. So here's an idea for adjusting the southern edge of Ranny Park, Matt Hole sketch, uh, so that when you go by, you can actually tell there's a park there. A lot of people look into the park and they see the skateboard park features and they're just not sure. They may not know about the great sledding hill that's just beyond or the history of that place. So um, I thought, why not think of it that way? And I want, I want you to notice th one thing about this sketch. The rearranged and reimagined uh, Frandor would not have the loading docks facing Ranny Park along that western edge, the back of house functions. It would face Ranny Park with the fronts of buildings, with the balconies of those people who live upstairs. It could really make Ranny Park into a great public space it was meant to be when the family donated that land originally. Um, uh, the Central Park. In fact, that's the west side, so we're thinking Central Park West might be the name for that address. And of course, the stormwater park itself, because this is the short-term project. The drain commissioner, his team are working on this. Obviously, the property owners who are, and those who are planning to build there, Mr. Ferguson and others, are looking at this right now. So the right thing to do is stay very alert uh, and very involved on, the, um, on, on that. Let me just make sure I know. OK. Now, uh, a second placemaking idea that's pretty important for this location uh, is what we mean when we say TOD, transit-oriented development. Uh, the other night, we, we asked people to rank scenes and say yes or no to things. And of course, the one at the top got a better score, and the one at the bottom got a poorer score. Uh, both of these have transit systems, both with a lot of riders. The, uh, the one on the, um, on the top has buildings set forward, and they're, they're tall buildings, you know, multi-story buildings, like in, a, like in a town. And the one at the bottom has open space and deep setbacks and low impact, low visual impact of buildings on one another. In other words, the one at the bottom sounds like a lot of what the zoning requires uh, in parts of this corridor. Things set very far apart and kept at low densities with high parking requirements uh, and uh, uh, strict height limits and limitations on mixing uses. And the one at the top, which got the, the better score in our little poll, violates all of that, building set forward, taller, mixing. Um, and so we saw, uh, here's another one, saw a similar result. Fancy tra transit systems in both of these locations. The one at the top has more development, not less. Um, here's another one. High scores at the top, low scores at the bottom. But wait, the building at the bottom is only one story tall. It has a lot less visual impact. Uh, you can say that again. It has a lot less visual impact. <laughs> um, so I'll put Paris one more time. You know, bringing things close together is a natural and normal thing to do in cities. And it makes money for the property owners. And it makes a city where people want to be. So pushing things farther apart, now it's Miami, uh, doesn't do that. Okay? It, in fact, it tends to make the strip none of us like very much. Now, this is, so this is a pretty important economic idea, and uh, some great minds, including Sharon Woods, who is uh, in the back of the room tonight, uh, Wave Sharon, uh, and Dina Belzer from Strategic Economics, have been looking at the economic realities of these places. And they're very cautious. You know, they're, they look at the next five to seven years, and they see limited potential, but potential. They see growth, but very modest growth. So they say, manage expectations, be realistic, don't overdo it. Um, I, I like Sharon and I like strategic economics because they don't just give us the numbers, but they help us with the strategy. And I want to share with you three slides from Dina's sum summary. It's, a, it's uh, many pages long, uh, but I'll, I'll just share a couple of things. First, watch those lines going up. Um, they're going up, but they're going up slowly. You're seeing total population, total employment, and total households. And they're all rising. So growth in this area is taking place. It's just not going gangbusters. It's not one of those hockey puck shaped graphs uh, that show things out of control, scare everybody, and um, 
in other metro regions. It's a modest, normal amount of growth. And of course, there was some job loss that's now beginning to correct itself. So this is the slow growth economy picture. Um, however, the corridor that we are on connects the job centers, the ones I've been talking about among them, the MSU and Sparrow and the capital area. Um, so uh, that makes this corridor a better bet than other places where those job centers are not there. And then three, three quick points, um, bottom line points that are their conclusions. The first is, yes, it is promising for supporting transit-oriented development. Uh, second, because of those job concentrations, uh, it's the BRT corridor is in the right place. And then the last one, strong base for further growth, but only if public policy is deliberately focused on spurring employment growth along the corridor, rather than in the region's numerous low-cost greenfield development opportunity sites out at the edge. So if you have a choice to pull growth onto the corridor or to push growth into those industrial parks out by the interchanges or onto cornfields and cow pastures, uh, choose the corridor. That's what they're saying. Um, there are a lot of reasons behind the, uh, the strategy that go beyond the job concentration. Uh, for one of them, the changing population. A great many uh, millennials that are coming into uh, household creation ages and the great many boomers that are retiring all represent great markets for transit-oriented development because they probably don't want the large single-family detached house on the large lot that Ozzie and Harriet wanted. Okay? Um, instead, they want to be in places like this, the, you know, where they can be with their friends and step outside uh, and enjoy a cafe. I'd urge you to Google this subject um, and type in the name Minicozzi, uh, M-I-N-A-C-O-Z-Z-I. That's that guy in that picture. Joe Minicozzi does an interesting analysis. He compares uh, what happens when you build uh, one-story buildings set far apart out on the edge of, of the region versus when you build in town. And he, and he compares them in terms of their impact on the tax base per acre. Okay? Um, the jobs per acre uh, and the uh, property taxes per acre and the retail taxes per acre. He compares here in that picture a downtown building with half a dozen stories, retail downstairs and other uses above on the right, and the Walmart out by itself on the left. Um, takes 34 acres to build the Walmart, takes two-tenths of an acre to build the Main Street building. Um, per acre, the Walmart is going to throw off, in, this, in that case, $6,500 a year, and the downtown building is going to throw off $600,000 a year. Um, that's using Asheville, North Carolina's tax rates, not yours. Uh, and then in terms of sales taxes, same kind of story. Um, twice as much from the downtown building and of course a lot more job concentration. So what this really translates into is that of the different kinds of forms of development you can take, say things that look more like transit-oriented development on one hand, and things that look more like the best buy out by Okemos Road on the other, um, here's the difference in their in economic productivity per acre. And as municipalities, it's that land you regulate that you have as your, your commodity. That's basically what you get your money from in ad valorem property taxes. So uh, in the middle, the little tiny little red line there is the Walmart, and uh, that downtown building is the one on the far right with the big green bar. Let's do a poll about this. To do transit-oriented development, you're going to build things closer together, and they're going to be taller than the buildings you built a generation ago. So I'm uh, curious about yourself. Would you support mid-rise buildings, four to eight stories, along the corridor? Obviously, that means in the right places, not everywhere, to facilitate transit-oriented developments. One for yes, two for maybe, three for no. Would you support mid-rise buildings? Poll is open. If you change your mind, it'll keep the last number you press. OK. OK, so the question, why. the quick 60-second question is, what makes it work? Why would you say it, or if you, if you 
didn't like it, then what, do you, what needs to be there to make you like it? So what about four, four to eight story buildings along the corridor? What makes it work? Economic impact. Economic impact. Works elsewhere. Less land. Less land. Works elsewhere. Works elsewhere. Sorry, yes, sir? Changing the parking requirements. Okay. Affordable housing. What about, sorry? Preserves green, Pre preserves green spaces, affordable housing. More attractive. More attractive. Shortens, Shortens commutes. One more. More people. more people. Okay, thank you. Higher and better use. Higher and better use. Thank you. All right, awesome. Okay. Uh, one last stop on our journey. Let's go out to Meridian. Um, remember this picture that we made near Okemos Road um, where, the, where the Walgreens is? So before and after picture that illustrates the BRT arriving in the center and then the edges of the street remade to be the walkable Great Street and later development that's street oriented instead of just oriented to parking lots. Now for those who might be wondering, there's still parking in that scene, it's just not all in front of the buildings, although some of it is, uh, it's behind and beside the buildings. Over time more buildings following that pattern, and by the time you get several together in a place, you're going to make an address. So that was the before and after. We also looked at different ways you can do the details, like that bike lane versus the buffered bike lane versus the cycle track. But those are details. Right now, what we're really talking about is this whole idea of whether an auto-only environment could be transformed into an environment that works for cars, but also accommodates walking, biking, and transit. An important thing to keep in mind here is that we don't yet know where the BRT line will end or start. Um, there are several possibilities. Uh, three of them are here. We looked at them together Monday night. Uh, a is, generally speaking, the area near the mire of the mire and its environs. B is generally the area of the Best Buy, and C is generally the area of the out parcels on the southern tip of the Meridian Mall. And there are other possibilities too, like doing in the center of the street or diverting uh, around or connecting to Old Town Okemos, there's several other possibilities. We don't know. So the question, of course, is that CATA will be keeping that an open question for a while because they're going to wait for a property owner to step up and say, we want to be the host for the transit-oriented development, the park and ride parking spaces, uh, and the station plaza itself. Uh, come to it on our site. So there needs to be a little horse race here between the different prospect locations. All of them are situations where you have to find lost space between buildings and, and underutilized parcels uh, to find a place to put it. Um, that's not uncommon. You know, a developer builds a mall or a shopping center and they save pads out by the road for the fast food place or the branch bank or what have you, they call them out parcels. And uh, those out parcels, I think in the future, with the BRT arriving, are going to start to look to you like places you could build your station area, plaza, your transit-oriented development. Uh, we're going to show you three of them. Recognize from the aerial photograph here the Macy's. Uh, we've, this is the computer image of the Macy's there um, with their sign big and bold so you can see it and then a, a, a what if and reimagining of their parking lots to make real street like streets and then the first few buildings around um, around the station area uh, illustrating making of a, a the first start at transit oriented development hooked up to Grand River Avenue and we went ahead and put a giant Macy sign on the foreground on the roof of that building so you could tell which one we were talking about and uh, if that's what it took to get them excited about letting you use that site for such a thing, that might be pretty worthwhile. Um, of course, we're thinking longer term than that because what you start at the station area will grow, but the components in each of these cases are the same. Streets, public space, street-oriented architecture, mixed-use multi-story, transit-oriented development, park and ride uh, spaces for commuters to leave their car and take the bus the rest of the way. So there it extends along a street and then later as you start to feel like you're running out of space and you want to mine that land for more value, the parking spaces can be folded up into parking structures and you can get more opportunities for development. So 
So there's kind of a mature, long-term vision of how what you start could grow. So where's Want to see that again? So in this case, the park and ride stop is right here. I should back that up one. Here's the station area, and the, the, the bus is doing its turnaround around this square. I'm going to show you the same thing on all three sites, just to be quick about it. Here's the Best Buy. You'll recognize the out parcels here and the, the uh, former Chuck E. Cheese and so on. Streets, a station area plaza, the first few buildings, and more development over time, including eventually filling in the lost space. We're using the same basic computer building block pieces here to show you these in every one of the locations since um, to help you compare one to the other. Here's the space in front of the mire. Picks up on the idea that that green space was already reserved in the front of the mire. Um, this one's exciting because it's a Michigan-based company, one that's showing a lot of uh, signs of being uh, kind of refreshing itself. They're in, embedded in the farm to table movement and so on. So kind of excited to think that they might be also uh, thrilled to be part of transit-oriented development. Who knows? We'll see. Um, that we went ahead and, and took the liberty of saying, gosh, that you could include civic uses here, the libraries or post offices or community gathering spaces. Um, you could include connections to Old Okemos. And there, there are all three of those on one map, just so you get an idea that there's a little node here that today is mainly parking space or lost space that can be filled in. Not much else has to be displaced or, displaced or demolished in order to do that. All right, let's get a poll question on going on this Meridian stuff. And um, this idea of finding lost space, where, uh, where, where buildings were set far apart in the before pictures and close together in the afters. Does your area along the corridor have lost space, like the empty lots or the underutilized parcels or vacant space that could be filled in to create the neighborhoods? One for yes, two for no. Okay. Now, these are, are correlated to where you live. So the folks who told us that they were closest to one landmark or another earlier on, we'll be able to, we won't know who you are personally, but we'll know where the answers came from. Okay? So what would you put there? What would you fill that lost space with? It's harder, huh? What? Green, Green space. Okay. Retail. Retail. Mixed use, Mixed use housing. Mixed use. Mixed use. What? Form consistent. Form consistent hmm. buildings that are consistent with the area. An ice cream shop. <laughs> Public venues. Transit oriented development. Art space. Art space. Specialty stores. Specialty mm -hmm. stores. Thank you. Okay. Now, how, how do you get new development? Uh, that seems to break all the rules of the old zoning, the high parking requirements, the deep setbacks, the low lot coverage, the short height restrictions, all those things. Um, how do you regulate it? One of the ways you do that is with form-based codes. We call them form-based because although they still regulate land use, like what's mixed use, what's residential only, what's industrial, and so on, that's pressed to a secondary role in how they're organized. They're not organized by land uses. And instead, they're organized by place types or street types or building types, forms. And so um, as we were working on plans, we were also thinking about the architecture. Um, Mahdi and the others were drawing what-if pictures. Here's a little blueprint comparing some big buildings and small buildings um, to see what it is about the grammar of those that could be translated into simple rules people could follow but with enough flexibility to allow creative designs uh, by architects with very different expression or owners with very different interests. Um, and so we started analyzing or kind of, t kind of dissecting the anatomy of, of the old uh, buildings and the new buildings to see what it was they would need to have to hang together in a set. So 
those are the things one would regulate in a form-based code. It's even possible to imagine buildings are radically different from one another, be behaving and belonging in the same street scene. So, you know, one can have the Apple store and the other one can have the old barber shop with the barber pole, and they won't seem like they don't belong together on the same street. Um, I would urge you to go to uh, look at the work of the Form-Based Codes Institute. It's kind of a parallel operation in some ways with the Charette Institute that teaches people how to do form-based codes and what the important components of them are. And on their website, you can actually read a lot of examples of form-based codes. What they look like is uh, not much like regular zoning. They have diagrams in them. They depict what it is you're uh, supposed to do, not just listing things you're prohibited from doing. Okay, so that's a big idea about form-based codes. But the bottom line on them is that they're, and for tall buildings and short buildings, what they're really designed to do is build, help you build the place you want rather than just the one you get by default. Um, the difference, for example, is summed up like this. A form-based code uh, will probably have a line drawn on a map somewhere that's called the build-to line or marks the build-to zone. That means the building or the parts of the front of the building belong up on that line to shape the public space. Old style zoning, the regular land use uh, sorts of zoning may have a rule about that, but it'll have a setback line. It'll have a line, and it, that setback only means your building can sit anywhere you want on the property as long as it's not closer than this. See the difference? So the, the form-based codes tend to be a lot more deliberate about shaping public space. That's how you would get the buildings around the station area plaza to line up with each other, uh, even if they're built by different people at different times. And they can include things like uh, modern uh, uh, environmentally friendly features like solar design and uh, rainwater capture and all the things that go into green building. So one almost last poll. Next to last question. Based on what I just told you, you some of you may know a lot about form-based codes already. The question is, do you think that approach might facilitate good development in your part of town? Remember, we're going to know from the keypad answer earlier which part of town yours was. One for yes, two for maybe, and three for no. Poll is open. Okay. So in a lot of the areas, but not all. Okay, so for those who voted yes, why? Why is it a good idea? What? Simpler. Simpler. Deliberate design. Deliberate design. Aesthetically pleasing. Functional. More functional. Timely. Timely. What was that? Walkable. Walkable. <laughs> Intimate. Human scale, special place. special place. Okay, for those of you who are in this end of it, uh, what would it take? Somebody who voted no, say, what would make you interested in it if you weren't interested now? What would it take? What are the problems with it? Nothing jumps out. That may not be immediately clear. So, you know, we can too much regulation. Let me just pull it out. Okay. All right. We can. Um, so we're, we're close to done. If you'd like to, those of you who didn't vote, you can actually come up later and tell yeah. us uh, one That's on cool. one if you'd like to. We'd be happy to talk to you about that. So we're almost at the end. What I want to do is just give you a couple of thoughts about what's going to happen next. Some of you have already probably gone to the Mind Mixer website. That's part of the um, of the uh, Michigan Avenue, Grand River Avenue website. You can reach it through links at Tri County. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put the link up in just a second on the screen. Uh, but if you, if you click on the MidMichigan Project for Greater Sustainability, you can participate in what's called the Mind Mixer, which is an online space where you can propose an idea or you can read an idea that someone else has proposed and say, I second that idea. Or I would improve that idea by doing the following and add your idea there. Others can come along behind and second yours and of course, you win if the more people second your idea. Um, meanwhile, the design team doesn't stop working. We're going to go home and we're going to boil all of this work into a report. We're going to be providing all the graphics and, and other materials uh, to um, the Land Policy Institute. 
uh, and the Planning and Zoning Center at Michigan State who are preparing a big important project called the Urban Design Portfolio. Um, and then in late February, our goal is to come back and make an update presentation of that booklet. That date we've tentatively selected because it coincides with the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission meeting. Um, and we think the tentative thought is we might do this unveiling of the report and the final results um, just before their meeting and then and when they can participate as well. So that'll come next. We're trying to stay clear of the holidays. A lot of you have given up a lot of time over the last eight or nine days. You'll have a little bit of a break. Thank you very much. Okay. We do have one last question. Step out of the way for this. Bill? Oh, well, do you think that what we've shown from last May till now, we need to go back and we're going to be refining this so far, so far, but basically, are we on track? Yes, probably yes, probably not. No. Are we on track? Okay. All right. Good. Thanks. <laughs> So we're yes and probably yes, probably not, no. We look forward. We'll take that. We'll we'll look forward to. So the mind mixer is the place to tell us more about wise, and to tell us what it would take to make it better. So uh, before you get up, would you please? I would like to have staff help go to the end of the rows and collect the keypads. So just actually p pass them to the end. If you could just pass them to uh, this way. Pass them to your right, to your right, and <laughs> staff will come around and collect these things. Please make sure you don't go home with them. Some guy gave me one that he's had since last May in his pocket. So uh, thank you very much. We'll be around here to talk to you, and we'll see you in February. <laughs>